Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Rob Schleifer. I'm a field application scientist for Thermo Fisher Scientific. This will be a demo of Transcriptome Analysis Console or TAC. TAC is a software that's useful for performing whole genome transcriptome analysis of um, RNA microarrays done with Thermo Fisher's microarray platform. Some of the arrays that you can analyze on this platform include Clarium S, Clarium D, um, miRNA version 4, as well as Affymetrix U, HGU133 or HTA 2.0. So all of the legacy Affymetrix arrays can be analyzed on this platform as well. What's really good about this platform and what I really like about TAC is that the analysis is fast, efficient, and designed with the biologist in mind. In the past, a lot of analysis strategies required scripting or in R or I other bioinformatics approaches, but the uh, TAC software has everything streamlined into a single pipeline that takes you from the cell files that you received uh, for your RNA samples processed in the laboratory on through the normalization and summarization process up to getting the analyzed differential expression and even beginning generation of some figures for common um, common uh, analyses. Also, there's no license required, so if you, you can have it on as many computers in your lab as you need without worrying any, about any of that sort of thing. Today's demo is meant to give you a taste of how to use the platform and uh, expose you to the environment of the software. There's a lot of things that you can do in TAC, and this is one of the, one of the great things about um, this sort of analysis is that the possibilities are very vast but and that can be intimidating but uh, we're here to help you get started so if you have any questions or would like some training or support about the microarray platform or this analysis please reach out to your microarray field application scientists or our Thermo Fisher support network as we're here to help today's demo looks at a study by Moreau et al. out of Dr. Daniel Kaufman's group at CRCHUM, which is located in Montreal. They're looking at HIV-specific CD4 T cell dysfunction and use the Clarium-D platform. Clarium-D is an array that can look at the protein coding mRNAs, much like Clarium-S, U133, or most uh, microarrays, but it's also the most up-to-date with a lot of content from long non-coding RNAs, alt splicing, RNA precursors, and any speculative content for which there are annotations. Basically, the design process for this array queried 15 of the most popular databases of RNAs and made probes to query anything and everything. So uh, this study published in Nature Immunology in 2019, um, I downloaded the data from this study in Gene Expression Omnibus, so um, here within Gene Expression Omnibus GSC 128297 is the accession number, and uh, you can download the cell files here from, uh, from the Gene Expression Omnibus. So, let's go ahead and import this data into TAC and take a look and begin our analysis. Now that I've opened TAC, let's orient to the program. There are three top tabs at the top, New Analysis, Open Existing Result, and Preferences. If you are brand new to TAC, you'll need to go to the Preferences tab and download library files. Library files are annotations for each of the arrays. To get them, you'll need a username and password from NetFX. So you'll, you just need to go to the website and register and get an account, and then you can download your library files here. After you've done that and downloaded uh, for your specific array, you'll need to go back to the new analysis tab and import files. So let's import the cell files from our study. I've downloaded them and put them all in this folder. So I'll click, hit Control A to select them all, and I will open them up and pull them into TAC. Once I have them in this pane, I can go ahead and manually annotate in sample attributes or uh, pull in attributes from a text file that I have specific for each of these cell files. Um, that's not necessary. We won't be doing that for today's analysis uh, just yet. 
Once I have them in this pane and I'm ready to perform an analysis, I'll need to select the type of analysis that I will be doing. All of these analyses are quite similar and are performing a similar task initially. It's converting from cell file to chip file. The uh, cell file being a raw data type and the chip file being a normalized, summarized file. Chip files can also be used in analysis as, as you could see when I uh, clicked on the import files, I could have pulled in any chip files from a previous analysis and performed that analysis. Um, any um, analysis that you do on a chip file will be a bit faster as your computer won't have to chug through as much data. Speaking then about the analysis types, there are three. Summarization is that a cell to chip conversion that I was discussing. Um, you can see that here, summarization only. So we would be performing these algorithms. These algorithms can also be used for exploratory grouping analysis or expression. Expression is performing a comparison, that classical differentiate, uh, dif differential expression analysis. Um, we'll be coming back to, to do that later, but for now we're going to start with exploratory grouping analysis. So we'll keep that here with, uh, with our settings the same on on SSTRMA. Exploratory grouping analysis is going to perform a couple different multivariance analyses. The default settings are for it to perform uh, TISNI for dimension reduction and affinity for clustering. Now I like to start with the default settings as my first pass for any type of exploratory grouping analysis but you can always come back once you have your cell files normalized and summarized as chip and uh, perform a few different passes, changing the settings to really explore your data. So with that, I am ready to go ahead and name, uh, name my file and hit Run Analysis. I have skipped ahead through time and through the naming and analysis of our, um, of our samples here. Here we have our results from the exploratory grouping analysis. You can see the sample table to the left and the results of our dimension reduction with Disney to the right. Um, one of the items that is done within the dimensional reduction is to identify these clusters. And so uh, C1 through C8, eight clusters were identified in this analysis and it's labeled our samples as such. Uh, this is useful to see what type of substructure there is in our data set. If I were to go back and redo our exploratory grouping analysis and say change our settings, for example, um, select principal component analysis or within, or if even sticking within TISNI, changing our perplexity, I would get different results, different amounts of clusters based on the settings that I that I did, and of course based off of the structure of our data set. Um, our distance matrix here, this shows the affinity clustering of our samples. So here each column and each row is, is one sample. So you can see that there's a little bit of difference in the clustering with affinity clustering versus TISNI. But you can you can uh, click around and identify which sample is which, see how see how closely correlated they are, etc. Um, this looks at the two uh, twenty thousand most differentially expressed RNAs, and you can um, and, and you can see this this cluster here. You can always select um, multiple multiple. Um, samples within our sample table to the left and see how it performs to the right. Also within the EGA analysis you can have labeling controls or hybridization controls, positive AUC and our signal box plot showing how our normalization worked. So these are some of the things that you can look at with your QC and um, we're ready to move on to perform our, our next analysis. So with this we'll need to click Reanalyze Samples and we can select All Samples. So we'll move on to Select with Chip Files and it will bring back up our TAC Loader. We are back 
in the loader. I've added a column here for our cell types from the study. Um, and now we want to do comparisons. So we're going to keep our analysis type here on expression for gene and exon. We'll use cluster one as a comparison to take a look at our, our cluster expression differences. And then I'm going to come here to the comparison setup wizard and show you the structure of those comparisons. So we see the number of comparisons that we're going to be doing, count showing how many are in each cluster. Um, also, you can add in an ex, uh, a comparison here, so we can go and say we want to look at our types and add each of those, right? So that way we can perform uh, we can perform the comparisons using a natural language, right? So if you're doing a more complicated um, study, say you want to filter based off of a based off of an attribute, or if you want to do a two-way ANOVA where you're looking at two different conditions, you can do that here. So the basic thing um, for this, these natural language questions, question one is one-way ANOVA, question two is filtered one-way ANOVA, question three is two-way ANOVA, and then question four is filtered two-way ANOVA. So once I have that, I'm able to click Run Analysis, and we'll look at our comparison. The first thing we see with our results should look very similar with the sample table and um, here on the left, and the dimension reduction here on the right. Now, you will see a couple differences between this view and the exploratory grouping analysis view. There are four tabs here at the top. Up at the top left, we see sample QC view, second summary view, gene view, and all splice view. For the rest of the demo, we'll talk through these four tabs, spending most of our time at our gene view menu. Uh, the other difference is while we did TISNI in our previous exploratory grouping analysis, PCA is done by default with any ex differential expression analysis. So. One thing you should see is that our graph here with PCA looks a little bit different from TISNI. And you can see that our clusters, while holding to their own as far as, as, far as um, the substructure, there is a little bit of difference between those two clustering methods. But everything else should look pretty familiar with our QC tabs for those graphs and our annotation and QC metrics within our sample table. Summary view shows us two tabs, the analysis summary and the gene lists and Venn diagrams. So first of all, the analysis summary is a good place to go to remember what settings we had for our uh, comparisons. So it shows us that information. We kept our settings at the default, so we're looking at full change greater than 2 or p-value of less to than 0.05 for our head-to-head -head comparisons. So as you'll recall, we are comparing the different clusters that we identified through exploratory grouping analysis and the uh, experimental groups from the study. So you can see the number of genes that are up and down regulated in each of those, and we're able to see that as we're comparing our clusters, we're forcing a lot of the significance into the data set since we're comparing of samples that are, by definition, some of the most different with each other. Uh, the differences in our biological groups are, and our gene lists are much more manageable. Keep in mind, this, it, this particular data set is one with a good amount of diversity and substructure in our biologic groups. So here we can see some bar charts of our differentially expressed genes, and as we scroll down, the more variables you have in your study, the more informative this may be, but it shows our sources of irrigation, where cluster one has a lot more of the variation explained by those groups than our, than our types, and as we expect, to be honest. The next tab, gene lists and Venn diagrams, it's a good way of seeing similarities or differences between our comparisons. So we can also use this to pull out information for when we have multiple comparisons. So keep in mind, we're just looking at lists here. We're not looking at the scale or significance or, or um, how much each, each gene is up and down regulated, but it's a good way of refining which genes may be interesting. 
So here I can have our list of genes that are, are differentially expressed in cluster 1 versus cluster 2. I can compare it to cluster 1 versus cluster 3, see which ones are unique or, or which ones are, um, are in both of those comparisons. So I could select those and create a gene list from the from that selection if I if I found those particularly interesting. So we're looking at subsets of inclusivity or exclusivity, and that can be very practical with in conjunction with exporting them or and importing gene lists. So you can export this gene list out and then pull it back into another study to compare two different studies. Um, you can efficiently do that here. The Venn diagrams in this gene list view can analyze as many as three groups as well, so you're able to see how three of your comparisons compare to each other. All right, the gene view. This is where we can explore a lot more with your data. Here we're looking at differential expression. So the first view that came up is our comparison of cluster 1 versus cluster 2. In the table view, we have the expression value for each of our sample groups. So cluster 1 here, cluster 2 here, and we're calculating the fold change in this third, third colored column between those two groups. Calculates the p-value, shows us uh, a descriptor of the gene symbol, and then what, what type of RNA. So there's uh, small RNAs, coding, precursor, ribosomal, etc. So you can help uh, identify and focus your focus your study in that regard. If there's other annotations that you particularly care about, you can add in more that you might need um, here with customized annotations. So if, within this, you can see some of the uh, popular databases ha are represented. Um, functional annotations such as gene ontology pathways, um, and then also if you wanted to do a, a confirmation of and verification of your expression difference, uh, you can identify which TACMAN assay would have the best coverage for each of the, each of the genes. So that's a nice feature that, that you can learn more about the genes. Also, if you're looking at learning more about a specific gene, you can search it in NetFX by right-clicking on, on the gene or within a number of genomic databases such as NCBI, Ensemble, and UCSC. Now, let's talk about the plot on the right. So these graphs are interactive from, from the uh, graph on the right to the table on the left. So uh, you can see if you select a gene where each of these each of these dots are are genes. So I can select a specific dot and it will pull it up in my gene list. So if I um, am wanting to look particular at a gene I see in my list that I care for, I can click on it and find it within within my figure. I can also search for a gene down here if I want to identify it within a figure. So this this figure here, the scatter plot, shows us on the y-axis the average expression for cluster 1 and compares it with cluster 2 and then colors it based off of significance with the non-significant or fil uh, items that are filtered from our table in gray. Volcano plot is very similar. So here we had uh, had threshold cuts for, for um, full change of 2 or minus 2 and then a p-value cut at 0.05. So once again we can we can select a gene, we can select multiple genes by right clicking and dragging and it will select multiple items within our table. Hierarchical clustering is the next figure. Uh, we'll come back to that. Wiki pathways is a is another uh, very very useful item. So here, this is one of my favorite features within TAC. It enables you to see a lot more of the biological si signal of what's going on. Um, so as I click on it, it gives me a list of the pathways that are most significantly enriched. So if 
by order by significance or by count, it will show it. So this orange bar here represents a relative significance as calculated using a Fisher's exact test. And so it's showing if the number of genes that are up or down regulated within my data set are more than we expected. So here I've clicked on the VEGF A, VEGF R2 signaling pathway, and I can look at it. So let me zoom into a sensible uh, resolution. I can click up here to go full screen. And once again, as I zoom in a little bit more, we can we can look at this pathway. So if I wanted to click on, on VEGFA, I could do that here. It will show me if it's shared within the pathways. I can go back to my gene table and uh, it, will, it will also be interactive. So here, if I click back on any of these, any of these genes, I can click on it within my table and it will show me it in that regard. So the pathways here, if it's, if an item is grayed out, that means it's filtered from my table here. So if I were to clear my filters, it would populate the entire uh, the entirety of this uh, of this table and show me every gene with a color. So if I were to do that, clear my filters, so I come here to filters and I'm going to manage filters and remove. Okay, so now after a minute, it will show me all of my genes within this table. So here it's showing whether or not uh, expression was significant, up, up or down regulated, so we can click on SRC if we wanted to and, and look at that gene within our table and see that there's not been a significant change. Okay, so uh, sample signals is the next thing that we can look at. Let's just drill down a little bit more into some sample specific views of each gene. So here each dot represents a specific sample. Once again our left table is interactive with our right so I could pick these two samples, come here to the left, click on sample table, it shows me which of those two samples in my list have the have that um, expression. Alt splice view is a good way of identifying some differences between groups beyond that gene level expression. So here we can look at differences between isoforms uh, that are expressed in your samples. So once again, here we're looking at cluster one versus cluster two. The first one that came, comes up on the on the list is a non-coding RNA which here there's two known isoforms of that. It's higher expressed in this region uh, in, in uh, cluster two, as well as at this junction site, right? Whereas uh, this, this region indicates that cluster one probably has more of this isoform, whereas cluster two has more of this isoform. Uh, so that you can, you can uh, identify some things of interest within this view. The, Software uses two different algorithms to identify uh, events, right? So we get a splicing index and, um, and, a, and an event score event name. Now, I won't dig too deep into the nuts and bolts of the algorithms. It's um, within the user guide for looking into that, but you can click on a gene and uh, look at the isoforms present for that gene and identify if there might be some, some um, differences of splicing events. So here this is an intron retention between the two different groups, alternative acceptors, three prime acceptor sites, things like that. So you can look at the structure view or you could look at the uh, genomic view uh, for a little bit better idea of the landscape of the genomic region. I've gone back to the gene view. It's still showing us cluster one versus cluster two, but that's definitely not the whole story for this data set. So I need to come here to this drop down menu, which shows comparison. So comparison shows us those head to head comparisons, but I'm going to come down to all conditions. So I can come here to all conditions for cluster one 
and it will show us a list of genes. So the genes that are shown here are the ones, instead of p-value, we're now using an f-test, right? So f-test for calculating significance of our genes. And so we can see the differential expression of this gene. This is not the most significant. Here's one that's a little bit more significant. So um, we can see the differential expression across our clusters. I can once again circle and select a cluster and see which samples those are, uh, where each sample is represented by a dot. So let's go ahead on back to our gene table and let's take a look at all conditions. Let's go to type. This was the uh, variable used within the study. You can go to the search function. If you uh, come down here to the bottom left, this, uh, this search box here, I like to use quotes around my gene so that I can identify it. So interleukin 22 or IL-22 was one of the uh, genes that was particularly of interest within this study. And so we can see within our groups the, vari the various expression of these. So say I wanted to look a little bit deeper and say, okay, these from this, these samples from this group, I want to know what the difference is between those samples and these samples in a broader sense. Okay, so I can come here back to my sample table, add a column, and call it, let's call it IL22 status. Then I can type within here, CP low. Can select these and then say these are CP high. We can uh, we could do the same for and just call the, call all of these EC and then uh, and then and then VC because we we're only looking at that now. Obviously, there's a there's a um, infinite number of ways you could do this. You could export your data here uh, within the gene table. So export here, e export your um, your selected rows and then hit, hit the uh, sample, sample signals for these and then you could have your sample sign signals for IL-2 that are uh, into an Excel sheet and then determine which ones you wanted to call high or low or any or any um, any type of bucketing of your samples in that regard. So we haven't really talked about exporting yet, but this this in any of the uh, any of the tabs you can export your data from from the table and what you see is what you get as far as the table columns or sample signals gives you that sample level data for each of your samples, whether whether or not it's all rows or, or not. So we can export that if we want to. Um, all right, so one thing is hierarchical clustering. So hierarchical clustering will take a look at what genes are represented within our table and then try to perform clustering of those genes. So with uh, 28,000 genes, in our in our list that's going to be a little bit much so what I'll do is I'll select a handful just because it'll be a better visual and I'll go and filter my table to to the selection and then we can perform hierarchical clustering so here now we see our our samples clustered by by each of these genes it doesn't it doesn't exactly follow our clusters that we had identified with um, with the uh, TISNI, but there are some things that are that are still holding up. So this cluster one here, cluster eight here, so still somewhat intact. We can change our colors based off of any of these any of these items. So I could come back here and even use this new annotation that I'd that I'd called, and it will show me uh, CP low, CP high, ECVC. So that's a uh, nice method of adding in some clustering with, with an identifier. Um, clustering, we can flip any of these 
that are needed. Say, uh, say it makes more sense to have this cluster swapped so that it's more of these on the left. We can do that. We can we can swap this one if we wanted, or or any of those items. So we we should clear our selection. That will change it so it's not highlighted. Um, yeah, and then we can come up to this triple triple line here and uh, save save our figure as a PNG, or or adjust our colors. All right, so. Yeah, if if we wanted to if we wanted to actually perform a comparison on this, we can go back to our sample table and then hit reanalyze samples, all samples, and we'll see in in the next pane that it has our IL22 status added here, and we can select a comparison, and we're good to go. So I hope that this demo has been useful for you. I hope that uh, you are you are successful in your microarray analysis and please if you have any questions or are in need of help don't hesitate reach out to our support organization and we will be there to help you.